it wasn't recorded in the first place. Um, bummer. Uh, okay, so testing on this one. Um, let's talk about uh, some, some general uh, principles, and then we'll be going to dive into some real specific examples. So, in this class, we're going to be uh, advocating the methodology on this test driven development, and we'll be talking about it. The idea here is what? Can anyone tell me? In what sense does the test drive the development? Okay, so that's part of it. That's part of the, uh, the philosophy. Um, Do you create the tests first? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So why don't you create tests first? After all, the tests exist to test some software. If the software doesn't even exist yet, why would you write them first? Yeah, you know what you're aiming for. Because often, you know, it's, it's like that old saying, you know, it's hard to get where you're going if you don't know where that is. Right? We don't know where we're shooting for. In very precise terms, we may end up taking a very winding route and creating a broken one. We'll create something that's not right, and then not right again, and not right again. So finally, we've really thought it through. And often, it's a much better investment to think things through up first about what it wants to do. And then start writing the code. Once we're clear about exactly what it is we want to do. So, so the sort of um, start phrase associated with it you make the test, you make it run, you make the software run for this test, then you make it run. You, you do fix ups to kind of make it, make it run. Um, and the whole idea here is critically doing unit testing while you're building the software. Um, refining those tests and the software together, but if possible, writing as many of them as possible before the test it, so you have a clear idea in mind of exactly what you're using to code. Uh, another principle we'll be emphasizing less in this class is we build for testability. We build your program in a way that's easily testable, and that means adhering to certain principles. What's something that will make your code testable? What's one thing? How could we, I'll give you a hand, based on one of the first comments here, you're trying to make sure the program works. What did I say was, uh, what did we discuss was important to make sure it works? You need to have a clear notion of what it means to work, right? So, so writing down something about what it's supposed to do, making that clear about your resources is important for testability. What's another thing that's important for testability? For, for making sure your program is testable. Okay, good. So having a, a clear way to go about testing that's consistent and easily checked, easily verified. When it fails, it's obvious. So some people go on and take my course 371. And a number of years ago, so I, I talk a lot about testing there, and we go into a much greater detail. Very sophisticated ways you can you can test your system on one of arrays, hyper hyper micro squares, and, and ways in which you can um, uh, do automated testing, for example, of your programs, all sorts of, of good stuff. And um, the pro uh, number of years ago, gosh, I think it was six years ago now, um, by students who are now gainfully employed in the software industry. Um, there were some students who handed in a project. This was not the RTPOS, the, the, the real time pizza ordering system. Um, this was another project with similar infamy. And uh, they handed in a documentation that their system was working. And there was automated testing of their system. So their system was being run through its paces by a uh, a robot source that was going and hitting the web pages and throbbing things, pressing buttons, and that sort of stuff. And that's the sort of stuff we do with clients. You have automated testing that drives your program through its paces um, and, and tests a whole bunch of functionality. For example, that's one type of test. So they handed in their reports. And the reports showed each successive test and said, you know, test run, test pass. And uh, actually it said test run, and then it showed three thumbs up. I don't know what the third one, maybe it was a big one. Three thumbs, it looked like three thumbs. And, um, and so I, I looked through these things, and then I looked at the law. I looked at what the actual test results were. The 
test result for every test that's in it. Something like um, uh, username failure to not log in. Something like that. So all they did is they, they made sure the test ran. And the test ran and failed. They couldn't actually log into the system, so they just gave up. And that was the three thousand <laughs> as part of it. So you should make sure your tests can run in a consistent way and that the results are tested that the results are verified. They're confirmed that yes, this worked. It didn't just run. It worked. Um, that problem is not restricted to third year students. <laughs> um, hopefully you folks won't won't fall uh, prey to that here though. Um, so you know, adding things like uh, tracing, logging, things to report what's actually going on while it's running, these things can help you recognize is it succeeding, is it failing, where is it failing. It can help debugging and it can help testing. Drug testing requirements. So if you have requirements, if you have a clear specification of what this is supposed to do, you, you try to derive tests from the document and value you for a number of tests right, uh, right there. Um, consider risks. So if you've added code recently that's fine things to test rather than other things, or if it's particularly complex code, you can test that. You set the state following the test. So if you, if you have a test that creates a file, for example, at the end of the test, after you verify it worked, get rid of that file. Otherwise, the next time you run it, it'll be in a different situation than the first time. You want to be able to test these things in a systematic way under control. <coughs> have your test run on a wide variety of machines. This is one of the biggest problems um, that you see for some software developers. They run their code on their own machine and they declare victory. What's the problem with that? Okay. So not everyone has their particular machine, but often it goes beyond that. Um, on their particular machine, for example, they're often an administrator. Their machine may have a lot more memory than the typical user. May have access to a much faster network. It may have you know, a much better graphics story. It may have a much faster, you know, uh, graphics uh, graphic story as well. So all of these reasons may mean that the program works perfectly fine on their machine, but when you take it to another user, they may encounter permissions problems, and they may encounter, you know, unbearably slow performance because they're running it in a very different environment. Um, and we'll get to this issue of a smoke test later, but um, suffice it to say that we often we often create uh, tests that sort of exercise the broad function of the program. Okay, one of the key environment issues about a test environment is we build these things called test scaffolds or test harnesses. So this may sound like an odd um, set of terminology, but the idea here, ladies and gentlemen, is is just as you know when you're building a Built. You're building the, um, you know, Red, Red Bear uh, uh, Center outside Arts here. Um, there's a lot of construction that goes in, not to the building itself only, but to building scaffolding so people can go up the sides of the building, put on tiles or whatever. Um, they can put in place the forms to pour the concrete. They can do a lot of the work that needs to be done on the outside of the building. At the end, then we take down those scaffolds. Similarly, for programs, we build a lot of scaffolding so during testing, we can test this thing effectively so that during debugging, we can figure out where it's going wrong. And when we ship the code to the user or unveil it as part of a web app or what have you, that scaffolding is not seen by the user. It was used to get us there and make use of periodic basis to verify things, but it goes away. So a test scaffold and a test harness are pieces of code that we create when we create a program to make sure that it's operating correct. There's other things like that too. We'll be talking about that, like stubbing and things. Okay, so this is a piece of code that provides a framework of context for the test target run. So if we're trying to test a method, trying to test a function, we have something which is neatly set up to test it under controlled conditions. So that thing, for example, might read input in from a user interface, or read input in from a file on disk, or from a database, from a network, um, from a database across a network, for example, and it will feed that input into the thing to be tested, and it will record the results. It won't just say, three thumbs up, I called it. It will, it will instead um, test it out, 
see what the return code is, see if it said, oh, okay, things are hunky dory, see what it returned, if it's the square root function, it'll give it a value, and it'll get the value back that it returns, and it'll record that in that same database. And that would allow someone to go and look in the database and see, is this working I put an example on a file on, on Moodle, um, it's this 2013.10.1.cc, and um, this basically shows an extremely simple test on this that reads things from the standard input and gives them to uh, a method, of, a function. And you might want to look at that because a similar test harness or a similar test scaffold is called for in, in the lab. For this okay. So the job I'd like of this harness is to test this. In this case, it's a factorial method, the example that I've shown. Um, and you know, it may test it once, it may test it many times. But the point is that the job in life is to set up this thing to be tested in a controlled way so that go and can test it and, and report back the, the result at some point. Verify whether or not it's correct. So um, test scaffolds and harnesses are a key part of testing. They are how you actually exercise the test and you'll start to apply them this week. Okay? Um, one point of mind is that sometimes the scaffolds can get quite involved. Maybe to test this function, you need to call this other function first and, and then call it. And occasionally we end up testing our tests. In a large software projects, um, you know, a software project at a Google or at a Yahoo or at a Microsoft or Netflix or what have you, they'll do quite a bit of testing of tests. Is this test actually operating correctly? Is it doing what we expect it to do? Will it indicate failure when the thing being called actually fails? So you're going to need to, to set up um, a, a test harness. I think I, I may have this. Yeah, um, excuse me. That's, that's not it. I didn't, don't have it up. Uh, let me just see if I, can, um, if I can. Yeah, here we go. Um, so this is an example of test harness. So here's our method that we call, and here's our name. And what is this main code doing? Someone parts it. Someone help me understand what that does. What's this C here? Takes it from standard input and it's putting it into this to this value called uh, in input. And it's taking that value then it's calling factorial on it and it's reporting that to the this to the standard output. So this is a trivial test harness. A more sophisticated one would grab its value from a database or grab, grab it from a file or you know, call off to other functions to get a value to give this thing to more hand. This is what I call a, a simple test harness. So this is the harness, its job in life is to get tests of factorial all set up to run and to actually execute it before the results. Does that make sense? Why you need that? Mm -hmm. um, and this allows us to flexibly test vectorial. Okay. Um, so uh, some some pointers along those lines. So I'll I'll save this away at test.